Then our next speaker is Eric Freeling from UBC, talking to us on deviations from universality in uh, lithium-6 dimers. Thank you. Thank you. So I was just informed that I have five seconds to give this talk, but uh, no. But I'll, uh, I'll, I tried to pad it a little bit to get to 25 minutes, so hopefully I'll be able to get it a little bit shorter and uh, give us some more time. But yeah, this is about some work that um, we did in our group in Kirk Madison's lab at UBC. Um, so a lot of the sort of initial stuff was done by Gene Pelovi, who was a former PhD student who kind of left this work when it was not quite finished. And then uh, Dennis and I did a lot of the remaining things. But um, sort of to connect this to the topic of quantum simulation and quantum computing, which seems, like, seems to me like it's the main focus of this workshop, I'm just gonna start out with uh, motivating why we're interested in cold molecules to begin with. So uh, I think Deep Gupta went into this a little bit, but uh, I, know, I think he had the same figure on his slide, but uh, <laughs> there's, um, in general, um, there's been some interest in polar molecules as a platform for quantum simulation, also quantum information processing. And uh, to illustrate this idea, I just figured I'd show a slide with one particular example. This is a proposal by Michelle Brennan and Zoller from 2006. And they talk about um, a toolbox for lattice spin models with polar molecules. And basically the idea is that with cold atoms, because they're completely symmetric and they have a very simple structure, there's lots of quantum simulations you can do, but a whole bunch of stuff that you can't do because you just don't have any interactions you can tune. With polar molecules, you have um, the electric dipole moment, which leads to this one over R cubed dipole interactions. They're also anisotropic. And um, so that already opens up a bunch of stuff. But then uh, if you couple these dipole moments to their rotational, mo rotational motion, um, you, you, well, you add an additional degree of freedom you can control. So um, through microwaves, you can manipulate the rotational levels. And then if you have them look, if you can, control individual sites with microwaves in an optical lattice, you can have uh, spatially dependent interactions based on the, uh, based on using the, tuning the dipole interaction through the rotational levels. And um, because if you have spin rotation coupling, you can also have uh, spin dependent interactions. So that lets you um, simulate a huge class of uh, spin lattice Hamiltonians. Um, so that's all I'm going to say about quantum simulation, but basically uh, because, of, because of work like this, there was a lot of interest in making polar molecules and uh, the first successful polar molecule, I hope, I hope that's correct, was uh, potassium rubidium in Junyi's group in 2009. And uh, they found that those samples were very short-lived. And this sort of phenomenon kind of continued. So, um, okay, potassium rubidium was known to be chemically unstable, but uh, the first chemically stable molecule was rubidium cesium in 2014. That was chemically stable, but it still reacted away very quickly. So this kind of led um, to a bit of a mystery, which is sort of what, 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 uh, what this talk is gonna be about, which is why do these polar molecules decay away so quickly when you have them trapped in an optical trap? And yeah, to, so to motivate some more is just, a bunch of different groups. There's been a ton of polar molecules made and also just other homonuclear dimers. Uh, and they're all extremely short-lived. And there's also some work been done on dimer atom collisions. Um, okay, uh, briefly at this point, I wanted to talk about our particular dimer, which is lithium-2, which uh, we actually know to be chemically unstable. So it might be, you know, it might be correct to ask how this can tell us about, uh, about short-lived samples of, of chemically stable molecules. But anyway, so I mean, for, for, the, um, for, the, for this lithium-2 molecule we have, which is, uh, which is um, in the triplet state, and actually for all homonuclear dimers in the triplet state, we know that there are um, trimer formation is always energetically allowed, and so is triplet to singlet conversion. But actually, in our case, the triplet to singlet conversion um, is known to be suppressed because you were... Okay, and I guess the structure is, I'm, I'm, I need some information here, which I haven't given you yet, but anyway, I mean, suffice it to say that tr trimer formation uh, dominates. Um, yeah, so how do we go about understanding how these ultra-cold reactions happen? So I, I thought I'd start with a picture of a Feshbach resonance. So think about an ultra-cold collision of an atom, and this is similar what, again, what, to what Deep Gupta showed. 
uh, you have some entrance channel and then you have some closed channel a different energy and usually you can tune the relationship between the two with a magnetic field and then uh, if you have two atoms coming in you can uh, the spins couple you can have a spin flip and make them make a molecule and if you have a third atom so you have a three body collision then you have an atom that can take away extra energy and then you can actually stay in this deeply bound bubble um, so for a molecule you can have a sort of a, you can draw a similar picture except you're going to have a whole bunch more levels so that when you get to the short range region you have like a complete forest of states that you can couple to it becomes very difficult to know what exactly is happening and um, so yeah long range you have elastic collision and then as you come in you you form some kind of four body complex and uh, you don't really know what happens there but then if you have an inelastic collision you come out with some in some different state or in this case I drew the trimer which is what we think is going to be happening in our sample and the simplest way to understand the rate at which this is supposed to occur is just to assume what's the what's sort of the worst case scenario the worst case scenario is there's so many ch uh, channels in that uh, short range region of the potential that uh, any part of the wave function that enters there just disappears into another state so you can yeah I drew like it's a black hole whatever goes in can't come out and in that case it's very simple to calculate um, you're going to be losing molecules and I'll show that rate in a second but it's just related to the um, basically it's related just to the c6 and um, so I, I put in I saw a paper last week that I thought was super interesting and that's why I wanted to put in a little interlude here um, which is about if you go back and you, you know you, so I was talking about a reaction but you can go back into the, this four body complex and even if everything's completely chemically stable I, you form this four body complex but there's actually no state that you're energetically allowed to go into um, you're still going to be coupling to all kinds of levels it's just you're not going to be able to come out to the long range in a different level than you came in with but um, you might imagine that once you're in this four body complex either you get another molecule coming in so you have a kind of three body collision the co collision of this four body complex with I, I, I guess it's a two molecule complex with uh, with another molecule and that takes away energy and lets you lose uh, lose your molecules or you can have a photon exciting this and there's some work in the last year that we were first there was a proposal that this is called a sticky collision because you have this sticky complex and then you can have another molecule coming in colliding with a sticky complex and that explains why even chemical stable molecules get lost and um, that was found not to work so well and then the second idea came in that you have photo association of this and the whole point of why this is a bit surprising is that people always looked at these uh, at these losses and saw that they're characteristically two body I mean you can just work out from the density that it goes like the density squared the loss rate and not the density cubed so why do you think it's a three body collision and photo association you usually think of a one as, of as a one body thing but the point here is that what you're looking at is if the if the lifetime of this complex is longer than whatever the rate is at which these complexes are being removed then your collision rate will just look like the rate at which you're forming this this complex and 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 the lifetime of this complex is related to the mass and for rubidium cesium this lifetime is particularly long and this this came out i think just last week on the archive and uh they were actually able to show in the group of uh i think it's cornish um they were able to prove that what their losses are coming from is a uh, photo association of these complexes so um i guess in the interest of time i won't try to explain these figures too much but suffice it to say that they can they basically modulate the trap to allow for more dark times while keeping the keeping the density the same as it would be in a trap at higher power and they can show that as they vary some um, some CW light that they also put into the trap they get a huge reduction uh, in the amount of loss that they see and they're able to they, they're able to fit from that both the lifetime of this complex which in their case is 530 microseconds and um, the photo excitation rates of these com complexes maybe I should say that the photo association rate assumed to be like fairly flat just because there are so many levels you can excite from this four, four body complex that it's basically independent of wavelength and um, well I thought this would be useful just to say that we actually can can kind of tell that this is not happening for us because 
the important quantity here is that you have the, um, the photo excitation rate, Ki, the power, and uh, your, your sticking time. And if that's larger than one, it means that you're, you're basically, well, you're, your lifetime of this complex is shorter than the time at which it's being removed. So this is an important feature. And for the case of rubidium cesium, uh, they, had some, they had a factor there of like 10 to the three. So obviously that was the case. Um, for us, it's a little bit different. So first of all, our dipole trap is operating at quite a lot lower intensity than theirs. Uh, I didn't really look into the details of why that is, but it's somewhat relevant. But actually the most important part is that because of this mass scaling I showed in the previous slide, um, the lifetime for uh, lithium-6 dimer, dimer complex would only be 20 nanoseconds. So that's like five orders of magnitude shorter. And we expect this process to be completely irrelevant. Anyway, there's a bit, bit of a de detour, but I thought in terms of my motivation, which is, which is describing why these molecules have lossy collisions, it was some, somewhat useful to say that there's been some sort of, there hasn't been a lot of progress in a long time. And now recently there has been uh, quite a bit of progress in understanding this. But anyway, to summarize what I wanted to tell you about how these reaction rates work is that there's this quantum Lajeois model, which basically assumes that there's this black hole, which takes everything away. And um, then you completely determine your reaction rate by the long range potential. And you relate that to some Van der Waals length and you get some unitary limit. And this is the quantity it's gonna be in our experiment. Okay. So now to our experiment. Um, we start with a lithium mott at uh, 10 millikelvin, pretty normal stuff. We load into a dipole trap, cross dipole trap, and the way we align our Raman lasers that we use for, for photo association from the atoms into molecules is that we just overlap it with one of the beams. And then we do an evaporation near the broad Feshbach resonance in lithium. Um, probably the cold atom people are familiar with it. And um, you have this these three body collisions that just let you form molecules quite efficiently. So as you go to sufficiently low temperatures, you convert your atomic sample into a sample of Feshbach molecules. And then from this Feshbach molecule state, we do a two-step photo association. This is also similar to a slide that Deep Gupta showed, but um, yeah, it's similar to an EIT phenomenon. And with two photons, you couple into ground state. You can't go directly from your Feshbach molecule state to the, to the ground state because of uh, basically selection rules. And maybe at this point it's worth noting because a referee asked us on this, this on a paper recently. I mean, I'm gonna be talking about the fact that we, just, uh, we um, studied several vibrational levels and always the, the n equals zero and n equals two rotational level. And that's simply because, uh, it's also because of selection rules. I mean, you have two photons, so you have two units of angular momentum. So you can basically have, you start from n equals zero, so you can go to n dash equals one and then go back to n equals zero, or you can go to n equals two. You can't do anything else. Yeah, and then this is the, the scheme. So we evaporate to form Feshbach molecules and then um, we make the molecules with this two pulse sequence. And then we have what we call our annihilator pulses. We just shine resonant imaging light in to remove any free atoms that remain. We wait some time to measure the reactions and then we unmake it and image to uh, get the time that we have. Um, okay, there's an Additional wrinkles, maybe not hugely important, but I haven't seen it discussed that much before, which is that the trap depth for the ground state molecules isn't necessarily the same as it's gonna be for your, um, for your festival molecules. And um, so we, we see that by measuring the trap frequency and then finding a power that will match the trap frequency for the two levels. And what you see here are dipole oscillations of the, um, of the atoms or the molecules. So the figure A is showing for the atoms and I'm just showing like that it, that of a 5% variation in the trap frequency is something that you can really easily see because you might be skeptical as to like how accurately can you measure the trap frequency, but you can see that there's a pretty significant diff difference when you take this out to eight milliseconds. And then the second case is just showing that, um, so the black trace there is the, um, the deeply bound molecules and the red trace is the uh, fetch molecules. And all I'm showing is that we're pretty convinced that we're matching these trap frequencies very accurately. And that's kind of important because you, want, you, you don't want to have too many dynamics in your system where there's some kind of breathing modes that you're exciting that are messing up uh, your conclusions about the reaction rate. Okay, I, I won't bother with that last part there. It's not really that important. Yeah, so anyway, I mean, when you do, when you do this two-photon Raman process, you get a two-photon transition and um, you have some very narrow 
resonant feature. I mean, the natural alignment of this transition is like six megahertz, but for this two photon process, it's much closer to a couple hundred kilohertz. And that's how we find the resonance for making this process, making this molecule, sorry. So this is already, I'm already a little bit slower than I, than I hoped. So I'll keep this part short. I just wanted to talk briefly about how we model this. So you have your uh, kinetic equation with your, your, rate, your rate change in the dent, so, sorry, your rate of change in the density and it goes like n squared. And we actually know that our elastic collision rate is incredibly low. So one of the ways that we approached this was to fully model the um, dynamics of the particles. And then we basically bin them periodically. So, so we, we simulate the dynamics of the particles. We bin them periodically to extract a local density and then, uh, and then calculate the loss that way. And um, the, other, the other method, which is somewhat simpler, is you just start from Maxwell Boltzmann statistics and then you assume you're in equilibrium, which we know we aren't, but then uh, the temperature will rescale because you're mostly losing atoms from the coldest part of the trap. And um, you get the system of coupled equations like this. And the only reason I'm talking about this is basically, um, this one is kind of incorrect for a system, but the results we get are pretty much the same. So I'll just move on to the results. Um, so here are the states that we studied. So this is the triplet potential for lithium uh, six, lithium two. And we looked at the V equals nine, V equals eight, V equals five, and V equals zero, just to sort of sample some range of, um, of interest. And uh, we, we did it for both, both rotational states in each case. And here are just the, I listed just the tradition, um, transition frequencies. And then the, the PGS over PFM is related to this trap frequency matching I was talking about. So this is just to show that like, for, for example, for the V equals nine, the trap depth is basically exactly the same. Whereas for the V equals zero, the trap depth is super different. You need to change the power quite a lot to keep the trap depth constant. And um, so, yeah, these are the results. And I'm only showing a few states here because basically the takeaway is that all the states were, decay exactly at this universal limit I discussed earlier, except for the V equals nine, N equals zero. And so this is the, the same thing in table form. Um, it's about half the rate. And um, to be honest, we don't, I, I mean, I'm, I'm gonna say some more things, but we don't really know why this is happening, but it appears that it should be interesting because it wasn't expected in any way, shape or form. So one thing you might ask is this universal rate um, depends on the C6. Could there be a large change in C6? And the answer is not really because for um, a heteronuclear molecule, you can have, uh, you have a dipole moment and then your, um, your vibrational level can, ha can strongly influence what the C6 is because you, you, you can have couplings within the, within the ground state, but those are all protected for a homonuclear dimer with no dipole moment. So then you're only talking about all the couplings to excited states. And then because of just the, the rate, you know, the separations, those tend to be quite small. So the C6 is like basically constant, should be const, pretty much constant for all the molecular states. So, um, so that can't be the explanation. Um, one thing to note is that at least why the N equals two might be at a different rate than the N equals zero for the V equals nine is that uh, you do turn on quadrupole interactions when you go to the N equals two because uh, for N equals zero, they're basically, they don't influence anything because you have something that's spherically symmetric. But for the N equals two, you can have some kind of alignment. So then the quadruple interactions can have a real impact. I mean, we don't have any way of showing that this is why the difference is, and it doesn't explain why the V equals nine is different to begin with, but I thought it was worth noting. And um, one thing we considered is that there's like a, you know, some kind of large change in the bond length where the V equals nine is so much more loosely bound that uh, when you have two molecules colliding, it basically looks more like, like sort of like a part of the molecule colliding rather than the whole thing. And then you somehow really lower the density of states. And we just did some order of magnitude calculation to show that that's also pretty unlikely because um, the difference between the V equals nine and V equals eight isn't that big. And uh, the last point, which is somewhat related to the previous one, except I phrase it in a more generic term, is there's some kind of phenomenon which for these loosely bound vibrational states is depleting your exit channel, which just means that there's less um, ability for the probability amplitude to disappear. And uh, well, I, you know, we thought about relating this to some change in bond length, which seems to be kind of not really work, but it, this is just to say that this depletion effect has been predicted for 
uh, dimer atom collisions, not really for dimer dimer collisions, but the fact that it's there for dimer atom collisions for lithium too might suggest that possibly, even though like nobody's worked it out yet, this, this could be an effect here. But uh, I mean, in summary, this is all things that we thought about why this might be different. In truth, we don't really know at all why it's different, but hopefully someone finds it useful. <laughs> yeah, so in conclusion, um, we performed stirrup to create lithium dimers from an ultra cold gas. Um, we, have, we think we have strong evidence that we see trimer formation just because for the ground state, there shouldn't be any other, um, uh, any other loss mechanisms because also because we exclude this possibility of photo association and uh, we observed universal reaction rates except for one single state and we don't know why. So, thank you. Um, yes, so I, maybe I have a slide. I mean, sort of, okay, so in terms of the, um, like, did you need special function generators yeah, to shape those pulses? Um, we do have, I don't, I don't know how special they are because they were set up before I was there. We have function generators that shape the pulses. Um, we, we, I mean, I think sort of generically, we had to accurately calibrate our, uh, acousto-optic mod modulators to, to basically get an accurate curve, you know, for power versus like RF power versus output power. And then the function generators we program to form Gaussian pulses. I mean, I don't know how special they are, but you need a function generator that lets you, that gets programmable. It's some, it's somehow pro I know that the function generator on the inside, somehow um, you program in a Gaussian pulse and then you just trigger it rather than like having to send it all from the computer directly. Yeah. And I mean, if, yeah, this is in terms of special infra infrastructure, what I maybe would, I mean, this is our locking apparatus, which is, okay, I mean, I'd probably have to explain quite a bit, but I think that's something that's quite intensive for people to do as well, because you need those two lasers to be phase stable to each other. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have laser pointer? Let's see. Uh, thank you very much for giving me a chance to, to give this presentation here. Uh, my name is Erhan Saglam Yurek. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher uh, in the ultra cold quantum gas laboratory led by Professor Lindsay LeBlanc. So I'm kind of representing our group, like one of the talks that from our group uh, today. So I will present our efforts uh, towards building a practical quantum memory using Bose-Einstein condensate. Um, so my outline in this talk will be like as follows. Uh, first, I will briefly describe quantum networks and why we, do we need quantum memories in quantum ne uh, networks. And I will just briefly mention though, the state of the art quantum memories. And I will describe our approach like outer sounds memory in Bose-Einstein condensate and uh, I will just conclude my talk with some future work. So like I start with the general picture, like big picture, as we know that uh, quantum information science promises technologies like uh, that unprecedented brings unprecedented computational power, unbreakable secret communication, unbeatable precision. So while each of these technologies are progressing independently, one of the ultimate goal is to combine them under single global infrastructure, so-called quantum internet. So uh, 
the concept of quantum internet actually is similar to the internet that we use in our daily life. On the other hand, the way that it works quite different. The re realization of a quantum internet requires processing and storing quantum information at local nodes and the interconnecting distance nodes using photons via fiber optic links or uh, free space uh, links using satellites. So then in this architecture then while photons uh, the atoms or atom-like systems are like processing units. Photons are the carrier of quantum information. So now, uh, for the realization of the such global network, quantum network, probably one of the first questions that we have to address, how far we can send quantum information uh, with photons. So then in this case, you know, one may directly consider that how about if you use the existing telecommunication technologies, which rely on the uh, amplifying the signals at certain distances to overcome the transmission loss. Unfortunately, this strategy is not applicable in quantum communication uh, due to the well-known no cloning theorem, which does not permit copying or amplifying quantum signals. So then second strategy we may consider just the direct transmission of photons from A to B. So, and then using say that the standard fiber optic links having the loss only 0.2 dB per kilometer. However, if you think about the distance like thousand kilometers and so, uh, the situation will be quite dramatic. Like say that you want to send photon here at the rate 10 gigahertz. And then to get on the one photon, we have to wait approximately 300 years to, to get the photon at point B. So obviously this is another practical solution. So uh, other strategy we may consider is just quantum teleportation. So we just get assistance, you know, some quantum mecha mechanical phenomena. Uh, so in quantum teleportation, just briefly that we need to have an entangled photon pair. And again, this is our target state at A. So we perform Bell state measurement with the photon that we want to send that information to B and then the, with the one of the member of the entangled photon pairs. So this we perform a Bell state measurement, which is basically uh, overlapping them or interfering them on a beam splitter. So uh, upon successful Bell state measurement, we need to still send classical information point B, some unitary transformation, but at the end we can successfully transfer quantum information from A to B without direct transmission. Although it looks like a fancy way of transmitting quantum information, one can argue that this is still not solving our issue because if you put the source here, the photons, entangled photons this time have to travel, you know, quite long distance here. On top of this, these sources actually, they, they are uh, probabilistic in nature. So they do not generate photon pairs and every time. It's really like the only a few percent of the time. And also Bell state measurement in this format is also probabilistic, even maybe this is worse than that. But fortunately, we can still utilize this the idea of quantum teleportation for long distance quantum communication. So now that the, we sort of adapt the concept of the repeater that's already used in the uh, classical communication. So we divide this communication channels, many uh, small segments links that I call that elementary links. And I show only two of them. Then in each elementary link, we have two entangled photon pairs. And then the, we have, again, one Bell state measurement station and two quantum memories that can store quantum states of light in this specific case, entangled state of light. So now what we do is that if we perform Bell state measurements successfully here, we can actually establish entanglements at point A to B. This is called entanglement swapping. It's sort of teleportation of entanglement. So now, once we, once we store, uh, once we establish entanglement now with our quantum members, we can store that information and the wait until all elementary links establish the same entanglement. So now once we have all in elementary links established, entanglement is established, we can perform final Bell state measurement between the elementary links. And in this case, we can uh, distribute the entanglement across the entire communication link. And then we can do our standard uh, teleportation if we want. So this is uh, this structure relying on the entanglement swapping and quantum memories. Uh, one of the a few solutions for long distance communi uh, quantum communication is called like the quantum repeaters. So now that uh, remember that our question, how far we can send quantum information now, 
translates into how long we can set, uh, store quantum information. So now if we just take an example, like uh, two element links over thousand kilometer, and if you consider the speed of the light, we can see that to do something really useful, the minimum level of storage time, we need five milliseconds. So we cannot do with any, you know, all optical technology such storage, uh, such long storage time, like, uh, you know, fibers, low loss fibers, whatever we think, just storage time always will be a couple of microseconds and so on. So now the only option that we use to use atoms. So in atoms, we have two possibilities. One of them is that we can use uh, the optical excitation, like we can map the coherence between ground and excited levels. It can be even on the order of milliseconds. And we can also map the coherence between the two ground levels, like spin levels, that can, the coherence time that can go up to even hours. So now atoms are potentially having this feature to storing length for, uh, for a long time. So, however, this is just long storage time is just the one part of the story for quantum memory to be useful in our, uh, this architecture, we need also high efficiencies. And also we need to them operate at fast rate that for communication purpose, that means at the same time that the, the broadband memories that we need. And also we want them to, to operate with high fidelity or noise free. That means that we can store really entangled st state of light or in general quantum state of light. So now actually having all those four features that at the same time is really quite difficult. We need to engineer light matter interactions to, to obtain all the simultaneously and to use really quantum memories in this uh, repeater structure. So now with this motivation, such a practical memory, to develop such a practical memory, there are a variety of, you know, the proposals. The one side of this proposal is just atomic platforms, another side interaction protocols. So now by using the combination of the platform and protocols, we can develop like a hopefully practical quantum memory. Uh, so I can't probably go over all details of that, all this platform protocol, but I can say that each of them has, you know, advantage and on the other some disadvantage. Just briefly, if you take a look at like, um, for example, warm atoms and laser cooled atoms, uh, they are limited with thermal motion. You know, it can't just go beyond a few milliseconds if you want to store the light in, in this system. So now, rare ion of solid system sort of just solves this issue because the atoms in solids like stationary. On the other hand, uh, they require cryogenic operation, but beyond that, there are lots of interaction of the atoms with the, with the lattice, even the uh, interaction between the atoms not really easily controllable. And then it requires also some spectral engineering in this system, and it's really hard to do that uh, with these uh, materials like to, to get these something practical. And the single atom in a cavity is another approach that we can use really strong light matter interaction in cavity, but building such uh, cavities is really very demanding. And then also to achieving really strong coupling for efficiency is something very challenging. So if you look at the prot uh, protocol aspects, so I just put the most popular three of them. They, again, they have some advantage, disadvantage. For example, EIT with the well-known example and the off on raman scheme, they are very good for storing long pulses, but because of their uh, adiabatic operation, they are not suitable for short pulses. So there is this atomic frequency comb approach, for example, is very good for storing broadband light, but on the other hand, really preparing this system is very difficult. So like, as you see that, you know, there's all like these systems, like somehow some inherent uh, disadvantages, like limitations to make really this qu practical quantum memory uh, uh, very difficult. All right, so this is like then so far that, you know, almost two decades of the research with quantum memories, uh, there's still no suitable combination of platform and protocol for high performance quantum memory. So now our approach here at is that we want to actually, we are proposing here, uh, the outer time splitting protocol, which we recently proposed this one in bose einstein condensate. So now let's just take a look at briefly these elements. So now why bose einstein condensate is good for storing light, I can tell the two main reasons is that one is that like, as you remember in cold laser cooled atoms and warm atoms, the thermal motions, the, the, uh, the, the delimitation, but we can, if you go to this 
ultra cold regime in the DBC regime, we can actually suppress the thermal motion and we can increase the coherence time. So the other thing is that uh, the, uh, the, the light matter coupling strength, actually this is directly, directly related to density. And then we know that in uh, BEC regime, we have very high densities, of course, in this context. So now in this case, an optical depth is proportional to the end, the number of atoms and interaction cross section, and we can have really like small uh, interaction cross section and directly it affects the efficiency of our memory, which is uh, exponential dependence. So for two reasons, really BEC is a really, really perfect platform. So, uh, just I want to briefly just review that what experiments have been done before with BC, like for quantum memory purpose. Uh, the interestingly, like the BC is one of the first platform that proposed for quantum memory, but there are not many, many experiments that you probably all know that this is the first experiments by done a group of Lina Hao between 99 and 2009. Uh, so they demonstrated the ultra uh, uh, slow light effect by taking advantage of the, the dense, uh, density of uh, the BC. And even they demonstrated the coherent nature of this process. And uh, they extended the idea that then they demonstrated the manipulation of light uh, with the, uh, light, uh, the matter wave property of BC. And then also in 2009, they showed that the storage times can go up to one second, which is quite impressive. So if you just take a look at this, just briefly, that all this, uh, the, the, uh, the what's, what is issued in this experiment, beyond the one second level, that first that they use the EIT protocol in all experiments, and the pulse duration, because of the limitations like that of the protocol, mean that on the order of microseconds, and efficiency is like five to 10% and so. So now all, also this experiment done in the classical domain in a way that the photons contain several photons in contrast that we need really uh, in single photon level and prefer the non-classical light for quantum communication purpose. So now in 2011, between 2011 and 2002, Gerhard Rampes group at Max Planck Institute, they also demonstrated the BEC memory. Uh, so uh, they show that they can store polarization qubits uh, in BEC with very large fidelities. And also, even that they, they demonstrated the entanglement between a Bose-Einstein condensate and a single atom by means of the photons. They stored the photon, and then by means of that, they uh, established the entanglement with a single photon. So the one big thing is that with this experiment, that everything is in the really quantum domain. And uh, again, they use the EIT protocol. Pulse durations are a little bit shorter, but still like on the order, you know, with the fraction of microseconds. Efficiencies in the real demonstration 15%, but they claim that they can go up to 30%. Memory lifetime is a little bit shorter, of course, compared to the other experiment, 0.5 millisecond. But overall, like, you know, there's pretty like the, the important progress. So now, then I keep mentioning the EIT is like not suitable. Now, why is it just, I just want to explain a little bit here. Uh, they remind you that the, how that the EIT works. So we have this generic three level system, right? And then we have pro pulse here and then weak and uh, prefer this at the single photon level and then relatively strong control field. So this control field uh, just makes a transparency window within the atomic transition. So now the catch point is that we should just select the bandwidth of the photons that fit inside Basically, it should not get absorbed, and this makes this whole uh, process that adiabatic relatively slow. And this is the general adiabatic condition: optical depth, pulse duration, and the, the multiplication of the uh, the decay rate should be much larger than one. So now, then we have that in this condition that we have the slow light effect. And if we just switch off the control, we can stop the light completely, and then we just switch back on. We can retrieve the photons. So now, as you see, that is like really works very well for the long pulses that really the definition of long means that it is uh, longer than the coherence time of the, the excited level. So, or the inverse of the, the decay rate. So now in this case, optical depths like even 100 here, but you can really reach like 90%, more than 90% efficiency and everything is really great. And control power just uh, almost the order of the uh, the decay rate of the atoms is also pretty good. So now if you consider broadband EIT memory, now 
the one thing is that it's uh, that if you want to have this large bandwidth, it just automatically puts us to outdoor time splitting regime. So now we don't have such a narrow transparency window. We have to now work with the outdoor time splitting effect. So it just split the transition line. And to, uh, to provide sufficient uh, slow light, you know, slowing down the light sufficiently, we have to really increase the optical depth a lot, like as you see here. And then here that this is only 10 times shorter than the uh, coherence time of, the, of the, uh, the atoms, like for rubidium, let's say around five nanosecond pulse storage. And on top of this, if you look at the control power, it has to be like two order of magnitudes larger than the compared to this case. And so extremely demanding. It's possible to store short pulses, but very demanding. So that's, it's not only the matter of the demands. So now I mentioned that we need to have reliable operation, noise field operation, and photonic noise in the system scales with the optical depth and control power. And then in this situation, we expect also a lot of noise. So now, uh, the our proposal is this now i kind of put in com uh, in comparison here broadband outer towns memory that we propose and the broadband eit if you look at the spectral domain picture that you see that now absorption line just overlapping with the probe that means that process we have is not anymore adiabatic it is non-adiabatic and then conditions change quite a bit much relaxed and then to store the same pulse, uh, uh, the photon with the same bandwidth, we have to have like that, we should have six times less optical depth. It's like already just makes big difference. And also control power that you see that there's quite a bit difference because we don't have to split this uh, transition line that much like uh, because we are absorbing. So now, and the operation of this memory scheme is very simple. We, during writing and read out, we have to make sure that the pulse area for the control, uh, uh, control pulse is two pi. So now why it is, you may ask, because we don't wanna leave anything in the excited level. Just if we provide this condition, everything just mapped to the discipline level. So now in this case that uh, really much less demand on control power and optical depth, and also we expect much less noise compared to EIT. All right, now with this idea then, once we uh, develop this idea, we just did some proof of principle uh, demonstration in cold atoms. I just quickly show that what those assumptions are. So we implemented a rubidium 87 system and used the D2 line. This is just our experimental outdoor time splitting. And then we use standards, you know, magneto optic trap and afterwards some the optical molasses. And then we had typically 50 micro Kelvin uh, uh, temperatures in our cloud. So here we demonstrated storage and on-demand recall. As I said, we have write and read out with two pi pulse areas. And we also demonstrated with a preservation of the coherence. That's like that we get around 94% uh, visibility. So also we experimentally demonstrated the performance of our uh, uh, protocol compared to EIT memory. Without, because of the technical limitation, we just tried 20 nanosecond pulse, but still like a couple of times shorter than the, the, the lifetime of the excited level. And then EIT gives optimally around 8%, 10%, and then the, we got like 22% with the AT, uh, ATS protocol. So then we actually try to go to the single photon level regime, which is really a requirement for this quantum communication purpose. And then we lower the mean photon number just down to the point one, and then we have very signal to noise ratio. This shows here that the background noise, you don't see that much as, uh, as you can see. So, uh, so now then uh, the, our main motivation, but can we just really the, implement this ID in bosons and condensate? So now what we do is that this is the, the cooling for the uh, atoms in previous experiment that we used, and then we had a more step, we basically use standard evaporative coolings. So we uh, trap atoms in, the, in a tight magnetic trap, and then we do so. RF induced evaporative cooling, and then we transfer the atoms in a cross optical dipole trap. And then with further evaporative cooling, we can reach down to, you know, 50 nano Kelvin and so. And uh, this to, to show that we have really BEC, we do this bimodal velocity distribution. And then also we observe change in the aspect ratio of the cloud as it falls, and as you can see clearly. So now after that, this is like we, we implemented this, the idea, this is sort of the simplifying experimental setup, cross-type moment, 
and uh, this is a control laser and a probe laser that as you see they have quite a bit angle that normally we should not be doing that but for this proof of principle demonstration we try that and the experiment done at single photon level and uh, this is the, our observation of outdoor time splitting uh, uh, for atoms that release from the dipole trap and this is our uh, time sequence on an experiment it takes about 18 seconds and so to to prepare all system so we just probe in a very short time that the atoms send repetitive pulses to get enough uh, uh, statistic. And uh, these are the typical BEC parameters that we have uh, at around 50 nanokelvin. We have nearly pure BEC and the atom numbers like 1.3, 10 to the 6. These are our trap frequencies. And then we can actually uh, calculate the, the extent of the BEC in the trap like the 10, 15 microsecond. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the, we were only able to focus down the beam to 25 micron. So as you see, there is like big mismatch here. To eliminate things, we just release the atoms from the trap. And then because of the repulsive interaction in BEC, they sort of match this one. But this was enough that to, to show that, but at the expense of having really significant or less density. So then the first, uh, then the, we wanted to probe the, the memory efficiency with respect to actually uh, the temperature, cloud temperature, we just, uh, you know, cool down uh, from the pure thermal cloud to down to the pure BC. And then the, we look at the, our memory efficiency. The observation is that for our probe size at 25 micron uh, waves, so the efficiency as we cool down increase and then it just reached to 30% and there's some drop here. And this is the, the, the measurement directly that I'm showing the measurement and the probe pulse that we use 20 nanosecond, which is like uh, five times or order of magnitude shorter than the previous experiments like the, the BABs experiments. So uh, this is now we wanted to understand, of course, to see that really do we really benefit from the large density of the BEC. We simulated the experiment uh, we got pretty much the you know, same behavior. And then you see that when we have the larger beam waste, just efficient directly uh, goes down. So it sort of indicates that sort of we are matching the size of the BC. Oh, yes, exactly. Yeah. This is like in that case, uh, 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 this is like the drop is once we have that almost 45% like the BC fraction. And after it starts to run. So this is at pure BC, we get around 14% efficiency. So now we just wanted to understand that how that it relates to density and an atom number. So with that, after you know simulating the experimental results, so now we just see this is the blue one is the atom number. So as expected from the evaporative cooling, uh, it substantially get lower. But we see that the, the BEC density increases, total density as well as increases, of course. There's a little bit thermal, you know, the uh, component thermal density much less than the BEC. And then the, here there's a small drop that we can see, but we see basically the competition between the atom number and the density. But the density wins here that just uh, the, we see that larger efficiency here. So that drops also related to uh, the total density somehow drops goes a little bit lower because we have no thermal component. So uh, the second thing that we wanted to probe the memory lifetime and in a similar way that we just change the temperature and we look at the, how much it changes. So now we started with here like the 6.2 micron pure thermal cloud and we go down to the BEC regime and it just changed from increases from 2.4 to almost 15 microseconds. Of course, compared to the previous experiments, these values are quite short, but we see that the, the magnetic dephasing is the main one. So when we are in the BEC regime, there's no thermal motion. So then we expect actually like much longer, but the magnetic dephasing is a dominant. That's why it just gets stuck here. But in all other rest temperature, thermal decoherence effect, especially with the given that we have very large angle between the probe and control, we calculated 6.2 microkelvin, 3.1 microsecond, which pretty much we measure, you know, the similar value. That's, that's also shows that we are benefiting in this experiment that uh, the, the feature of the BEC. So, uh, we also tested that uh, the noise level our memory and then this time we did storage in the pure BC 
and then we lower the mean photon number down to 0.2 and this black things that you see the noise count that we get like pretty much we don't get any noise that is also another advantage again smaller control power and less optical depth is the, that results in that and also we have a little bit large angle compared to uh, the other experiments this is for almost the final thing so now we sort of really probe that we take advantage of BC under in limited condition, given that we have, you know, the, the beam size is still quite large, but we asked the question, how about if we lower the beam size, if we achieve that, what will happen? What will be the performance? And then let's look at first the memory efficiency. So uh, with that memory efficiency, really we expect like the close to more than 90% efficiency for the storage of 2.2 nanosecond pulse, like approximately 200 me uh, megahertz bandwidth. But when the beam size should be like the around like the one micron or two micron as people using, uh, uh, you know, uh, the optical tweezers experiments. So now other thing is that we looked at the bandwidth scaling, how we really benefit this ultra coldness in, the, uh, in this regime. As you see that when we uh, cool down the temperature that we expect to get really larger and larger bandwidths, it's like fraction of gigahertz, really it just makes this system suitable in general for fast operation. And the memory lifetime, imagine that we suppress this magnetic dephasing, a lot of people did it. So in this case, we, there are two main, actually there are more decoherence mechanism, but two main decoherence mechanism in relatively short time scales, the thermal one. And then also in the BEC then, uh, this time we have this inelastic collisions. So that just becomes a role. But on the other hand, these like we just calculated that the, the, uh, the time scale is we expected a few hundred milliseconds, 250 millisecond range that it just uh, become really the effective. And if we had only thermal say that, let's just go only 20, 30 milliseconds. So we would be seeing really directly the, the benefit of the BEC in terms of the memorial lifetime. And the final thing is that this is a noise scaling. As I said before, that like when we want to have the large bandwidth, it requires large optical depth for all memory protocols. And then it requires a large control power. So now we just look at for these bandwidths, if we could uh, implement EIT optimally, and if we could implement ATS, what would happen to the relative noise strength? So there are many different noise uh, mechanisms, but we just took the one four-way mixing noise, which is the most common one. So four-way mixing noise is just scaling with the uh, fourth power of the Rabi frequency, control Rabi frequency, and the hyperbolic sine function, there's a chi parameter here. So the chi is proportional again, optical depth. So now if you just simulate it with respect to bandwidth, again, optimal means that we just really get large, the best possible efficiency. So now this is the, the noise scaling of the EIT, and this is the ATS memory protocol. And as you see in every point that we have at least three to three to four order of magnitude difference in the noise. So that we will we want to also calculate really what will be the impact directly in the, in the, uh, the measurements that we, uh, we would like to do. So uh, this is like uh, my conclusion, like I probably should mention what are the future steps. You would like to obviously demonstrate a high performance quantum memory. And the main thing that really match the size of the beast at least in our system. And uh, also multiplexing, I didn't mention this is another important feature for quantum communication. Uh, we would like to add that feature. Uh, we would like to explore uh, the processing capabilities of the photonic quantum information processing capabilities of BC. And uh, then one obvious direction that interfacing with non-classical light sources. And also uh, the another obvious direction probably using an on-chip uh, BEC with portable design that we can really have truly practical quantum memory. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much for the presentation. Do we have any questions? Yeah, over here. Very general question. So if I think about BEC uh, in terms of, you know, in connection to EIT um, and, and the memory uh, application, I can think about, you know, compared to the thermal gas Doppler shift being suppressed, that probably contribute to some of the factor. And the inelastic scattering also modified uh, by, the, uh, by the condensate, right? I mean, there's a statistical mm -hmm. uh, effect there. Are these the 
two major factors contributing to this using BEC to do the live. Right. Or, or there are so other There are some there are others, other yes. Aspects. Yeah, like in interferometer, you know, in, in it, for the matter wave interferometer, really people look into this, all this decoyers mechanism, pretty much the same that for our, you know, uh, our memory, this uh, quantum